What if there were nine simple exercises that can guarantee a more stable and confident left hand, better control of your sound production, and unlock your understanding of the fingerboard and its geography? Well, today I'm going to share those nine exercises, which come from the great teacher Samuel Applebaum, and I found them in this wonderful old book that is now out of print. So I'll start with a quick summary of each exercise. Um, so number one is a set of exercises that will establish a relationship between the first and fourth finger and the frame of the hand. Uh, number two is a glissando exercise that will develop the ease of travel on the fingerboard and sharpen your ear to the constant measuring that we're doing all across the fingerboard. Number three is called the matching tone study and this will help you control the differences in sound production on different strings and also further remove the restrictions uh, of the arm when it moves across the fingerboard. Number four will develop your control of bow speed in different positions. Number five is a fun exercise. Uh, it's going to help you stop searching for notes on the fingerboard. Number six is an exercise for shifting with two finger patterns. Number seven is a glissando exercise designed to improve your intonation. Number eight is a clever exercise using natural harmonics, and it's going to help loosen and unlock your left hand. And finally, number nine is a dexterity exercise using double stops. Before we get into it, I just want to take a moment to thank my Patreon subscribers. Um, your support throughout the last several years has been uh, crucial for me to have the time and space to to develop these ideas and to pursue um, kind of things that interest me and things that I think will be beneficial for all of you. In addition to many other videos on Patreon that you won't find on YouTube, I also do a monthly Zoom call with uh, all my patrons uh, where you can ask questions, you can even play for me and for the whole group to receive some feedback. Who is Samuel Applebaum? Applebaum was known as um, a curious and talented teacher um, also, he was a composer and a researcher, and he's actually the father of Michael Tree, who was the wonderful violist of the Guarneri String Quartet. Applebaum was also a prolific writer, and he wrote everything from a, a successful series of textbooks for young musicians to um, kind of a more serious treatise on the art of violin playing. But for me, his crowning achievement was his 14-volume series of books called The Way They Play. This is an amazing encyclopedia of sorts uh, of musicians of the day, all the great violinists we love. Um, Applebaum interviewed them, asked them about advice on technique, about repertoire, pedagogy. Um, there's all sorts of funny anecdotes and a lot of beautiful and uh, helpful photography as well. I could get lost for hours reading them and you can usually find them on eBay and sometimes for not a very high price. For the first exercise, we're going to play a one octave scale on one string and we're gonna play it with first finger going up the scale and we're gonna play each note by plucking the string with the pinky. One of the most common causes of bad intonation is an unstable and sort of random frame of the hand. So this exercise is going to establish a proper relationship between one and four um, and on different strings across the entire fingerboard. I'd recommend starting on the E string. I think that's a bit easier at the beginning. So there are several things going on here. First of all, the pizzicato itself. Um, make sure you get kind of a good grip on the string with the pinky. You don't want to be plucking it with your nail, right? So get on the A string side of the E string, and you should be able to kind of bend the E string a little bit with the pinky, and that's how you know you have kind of a good grip on it. Um, that'll also allow you to do it with less tension, because there's just more meat on the bone. So that's the pizzicato. 
Um, now with the first finger, you want to have pretty good pressure into the string, not too much, but typically with pizzicato, we do want um, a higher level of pressure in the left hand so that the notes ring. If I didn't, if I had light pressure, there's no ringing. Now there's ringing. The next thing to pay attention to here is the way you shift and how that affects your arm and your thumb and your hand. We want to shift with the entire hand um, from the arm so that everything is traveling together and that there are no obstacles for the thumb. So it's not kind of stuck in one place, then it kind of jumps to another place as you go up. Everything is very smooth. Now notice what happens when I go into fourth position. My thumb comes under the neck and my arm swings to the side like this, right? So you can, you can sort of practice that motion. And that sets me up for the higher positions. Otherwise, you get into this kind of position where you're stuck. And if you're reaching with the wrist, you've lost the entire frame of the hand. So the frame is your reference of one, two, three, four. Where are those notes in any position, right? If you don't have that frame anymore, intonation will be uh, close to impossible. And make sure to release the pressure of the finger a bit as you're shifting, right? Even if we're pressing a little more for the note itself, we still want to release for the shift so that the shift can be quite smooth. So you see on the D string, it's a little harder. Right, I, I want to make sure I don't clip the A string or clip the G string. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to be very shallow on the D. Just as I did with the E, I want to kind of get under the string a little bit with the pinky so that I can bend it like this, you see? And that gives me the leverage to have a very big ringing sound. The same way that you'd do it with the right hand. You want to have a little bit of pressure on the string and that gives you the most ringing natural sound. Now a variation of this would be using backwards pizzicato. This is often a virtuoso technique but actually can be very useful in some situations and actually easier in some situations. So backwards meaning I don't pluck this way, I pluck that way. So I get on the other side, on the D string side, and I pluck towards the imaginary C string. The placement here is very important. You want to get really between the D and the G, and then push against the G. Right under the nail. It's very difficult here. There it is. Yeah, now the key is not to tense up. Try to find the right position slowly, calmly, without any extra tension. Place the finger without anxiety. Um, feel that resistance against the string. For part two of this exercise, we're going to do the same thing, but instead of pizzicato, we are now going to use artificial harmonics. So putting one down and then touching fourth finger. So you notice I'm dealing again with the relationship between one and four, except now it's kind of from a different perspective. So you can do this on different strings in different keys, and you should also do different bowings. So I was just doing um, all separate there. You can also do two note slurs. Or we can do four note slurs. And we could do bowings with rhythms. So the two that we'll be doing 
are 16th plus 8th and the opposite, 8th plus 16th. So 16th plus 8th would be... And then 8th plus 16th would be... And again, I'm paying attention to the thumb, making sure it's loose, making sure it comes under the fingerboard, under the neck, as we uh, go into fourth position and beyond, um, making sure I swing the arm under. I want an unrestricted motion, yes? Another important thing to pay attention to is your sounding point. Sounding point is one of those things that's so upstream of everything else. Uh, if your sounding point is not correct or not close enough to being correct, nothing else you do will make up for that fact. And you won't like your sound and you'll think uh, maybe it's something here, maybe it's my finger pressure or something like that. We definitely want to start somewhere around the middle, I would say a bit closer to the fingerboard. And then by the time I get here, See, I'm now closer to the bridge, right? So pretty much on both sides of the middle. Not the extreme bridge, not the extreme fingerboard. The other thing you see me doing is using a lot of bow. Harmonics love bow speed, they love air. It's not like detaché where we can have this sort of condensed and um, focused sound. If I did that with harmonics, it's a bit of a rough sound, so I need a lot more motion. So it's those two things, sounding point and the amount of horizontal motion, right? Those are the things that are upstream. Set that first, then worry about everything else. Exercise number two is going to be a two octave scale on one string. We're going to start on the G and we're going to go all the way up just with first finger. One of the greatest sources of tension that we face as violinists is what happens when we have this broad movement all the way up and down the fingerboard. Unlocking this tension and sort of removing the restriction is absolutely crucial for everything, for intonation, uh, for beautiful vibrato, for beautiful sound, uh, for musical ideas to kind of have an organic quality to them. It's another one of these kind of upstream concepts like if you don't have that mobility and looseness, you can have the best vibrato in the world, you could have great intonation, but because of that one thing, uh, none of your skills are going to really be able to shine. It's like a great opera singer who has to sing like this. You know, they could be the best in the world, but it won't matter. Now we're gonna continue with second finger. So we're gonna go open, one, two, and then do the whole G major scale again, uh, except with second finger. Now this time, pay attention to what I just talked about, this mobility, and notice how I move the instrument. Um, you know, we don't want the instrument to be like a rock and that we have to move around it. The instrument can move with us as we sort of swing our arm around, and we can raise the instrument as well to have an easier reach for some of these top notes. So you notice on the way up, 
I come down with the thumb and around with the arm to prepare that higher position. Um, then on the way down, I'm already starting to pull a bit from the thumb, uh, sort of pulling the hand backwards. Because if I just do this with the hand, uh, it gets stuck, right? The thumb is stuck here, and then we have to jump to the normal position. Um, so you already want to start moving that. If you notice how I'm shifting, I'm not shifting. Kind of, I'm not trying to hide it. I'm not doing it really fast. I call this the sloth. So we're moving very, very slow. So shift early and shift slow. Because then you can really develop the awareness of what's happening with every shift, right? Is the thumb getting tense? Am I squeezing? All the things we've talked about. Then same thing with uh, third finger. I'll do it on the A string this time. And you can also add vibrato. So I'll add vibrato this time. And then on the E string, I'll use the fourth finger. So we do open one, two, three, four, and then going all the way up with four. One thing you'll notice from this top-down view is as I go up, I'm making sure to not allow the pinky or any of the other fingers to kind of bend over to the other side. I want to be like an ice skater uh, carving into the ice, going at that angle. Because then if I lose that angle, then it's very hard to shift. I'm kind of dragging the hand uh, instead of pushing through, which requires far less effort. So these glissando exercises are so important. Uh, it really trains your ear. Intonation is a skill of the ear, not really of the hand. Um, so each time you're getting a more and more intimate understanding of what is a whole step, what is a half step uh, in first position, in fifth position, in tenth position. Right? All of those are going to be a bit different. And even on different strings, it's going to be different. So by removing the kind of different fingerings and other complications, and just sliding around with one finger, you can really learn a lot about the fingerboard. And I would make sure to do this exercise with those same bowings that we talked about. Détaché, uh, two-note slurs, four-note slurs, and the two-note rhythms, right? Sixteenth plus eighth, or eighth plus sixteenth. As with the previous exercise, I'm paying very close attention to my sounding point. Now I'm starting kind of in the middle. By the time I get to the top, so to summarize, uh, I'm paying attention to what changes as I move to the higher positions. How does the finger pressure change? And you should experiment with this. Uh, try lighter finger pressure, find that minimum. I'm actually not pressing very much here in the first position. But as I go up higher, that same pressure won't even get me down to the fingerboard. Of course, it depends how tall your strings are. Typically, the string height is going to be much taller the higher you go up on the fingerboard. So that means you're going to have to apply a bit more pressure with the finger. Our third exercise is arguably one of the most important. It's called the matching tone exercise. And this is important for controlling the intonation and sound quality of identical notes on different strings in different positions. Why is that important? Well, 
Each string has a different thickness and therefore a different uh, tension and a feeling of response. And likewise, each position on the fingerboard feels different as well, not only in terms of intonation, but how much we press down, the shape of our hand. A lot of things are changing. So if we can learn to take the same note and play it the same way in different parts of the fingerboard, it means we've really attained a level of control of all those parameters. We're gonna start on the E string with first finger F. Go to the A string, second finger, also F. Now the D string, third finger, also F. Now finally on the G, I'm gonna get into that higher position and find the same F on the G string. All those sound quite different. So my task with this exercise is to make them sound the same. So I'm gonna play around a bit with it. Now after I've gotten better with that, and it's already quite difficult, I'm going to move to F sharp. So now F sharps everywhere. It's a little bit flat. To remind you of something. So as before, we're looking for that freedom in our arm as we swing from the lower positions to the high positions and the thumb doing its job and the hand coming up we want a lot of space there. And you could start this by shifting with a, a guiding note or a ghost note. So. And what we're looking to match is the density of sound, the quality of sound. Uh, if you're gonna vibrate, then the magnitude, the width and the speed of the vibrato. Try to really make them sound identical. And as always, we're paying attention to tension, squeezing in the left hand, we don't want that. And all of our elements of sound production, as we've discussed, sounding point, bow speed, bow pressure. So learning to match notes in this way and making those adjustments on the fly will really will give you excellent control over your sound and will result in a, a broader palette of expressive possibilities. Without too much thought, you'll know exactly the right combinations required for this kind of sound or that kind of sound, whatever you can dream up in your imagination. Moving on to exercise number four. Uh, it goes like this. So this is a great exercise for a number of things. Uh, we're matching intonation of the same little uh, passage in this octave and an octave above it. And we're continuing our work on ease of shifting um, through the different parts of the fingerboard. And most importantly, we're regulating extremely contrasting bow speeds, right? So the, the first note, which is separate, needs a very fast bow. So if we have a fast bow, what do you think that means about the sounding point and about the pressure in the stick? So that way we can get a whole bow on this first 16th note. And then we have a slow bow. So... Now take another guess. What changes when we go to the higher position? Both in our slow bow and our fast bow. So I'm still doing a similar thing, relatively speaking. This note is fast, it's a little bit further from the bridge, and I'm using less pressure. And 
the slow bow is a bit more pressure, a bit closer to the bridge, and of course a slower bow speed. But everything has shifted a bit closer to the bridge. Now very important for this exercise is that you don't let the bow slide all over the place. And that might happen because the faster you move the bow, the more sort of volatile it is. So any inaccurate angles will be amplified just because of the speed of the bow. And so the bow is more likely to veer off. So that's the first thing. Now the second thing is make sure the bow stays on the string. Don't let it jump or come off of the string. We also don't want to overpress, right, to compensate. The key is to draw the bow in a, imagine that straight imaginary line and your fast motion is in that line. It's not just kind of a, a jerk of the arm in some direction. Right, that way you'll have a straight bow. It'll stay on the tracks, so to speak. You won't get these bouncing noises. Now remember, we're using the whole bow to play this. So try not to get stuck using you know, the upper half, avoiding the frog. So as you get better with controlling these different parameters, um, it's going to allow you in actual music to play things with sudden contrasts. Like in Mozart, very often you have the character of the music changing on a dime. You have something slow, and then suddenly it's jumpy, and suddenly it's loud and soft. Those kinds of things have to be prepared. They often can't be gradual, and so you have to know what you're going to do differently in the bow for that change to happen. Not to be ignored, of course, is intonation, and as you go to the higher octave, all those intervals are compressed, even to the point where I'm replacing fingers. So if you notice what I'm doing uh, between three and four, I'm pushing three out of the way. Otherwise, there will be no way to play that tight half step. I don't have to do that in first position. Once you get comfortable with the initial pattern, uh, move on to first finger G. Same thing an octave higher. Right, and then you can do A with the B flat. The measurements are going to get very small up there, so this finger replacement idea will, will come in handy. And of course, do the same thing on the A string, the D string, and the G string. You could mix it up. Uh, maybe one day you do only A string, one day you do only G string, and so on. So if you suffer from tightness in the left or right arms or the hands, and you just don't feel that free swinging motion, uh, this will be a great exercise for you. For our fifth exercise, and this one's kind of fun, we're going to pick any note between this D and that G, so that range of notes um, on the G string. And I encourage you to, to sing the note of your choice, maybe name it out loud, really imagine it. Because what we're going to do is with our fourth finger, we're going to attempt to find it from the air just after having heard it in our mind, imagined it, enunciated it. So picture its position on the fingerboard and then just drop the finger in that spot. So let's say, start it pretty easy, F sharp. Imagining where it is. Let's try A. So it's going to be this A. I think my parrot is faring better than I am. So when you get that A, this one will ring sympathetically. Uh, let's try something more challenging. How about um, B?
Okay, how about C natural? B again. So you can move it. Wait a little bit and then correct it. Don't frantically try to correct it. And then feel what that difference was. I'm trying to feel where am I touching the instrument on the palm, right? The rib of the instrument will touch the palm in some particular spot. Right, so I'm looking for hints. It's too hot. If I lower the contact point a little bit on my palm, uh, suddenly it feels correct. Um, likewise, I'm trying to feel this contact point with the index finger. Where is it exactly? And likewise the thumb. You know, is the thumb here? Is it here? 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 All those things will make a difference. And you want to get to a level of consistency where you feel uh, that any particular note is kind of the culmination of how it feels, how it looks, how it sounds, the angle of the thumb, angle of the hand, angle of the arm. So this likely won't be perfect and you may never perfect all of these notes, but if you just become more confident on one or two notes that you weren't confident with before, that's really the key. And then you can branch out, go to one of the adjacent notes. Because one of the things we're always doing as violinists is we're preemptively imagining what we're about to play, right? That's what every great violinist does, whether it's like the beginning of a scale or this passage that's coming up. Um, we're hearing it in our mind, imagining where the finger is going to be, right? You don't want your mind and your ear behind your hand. And that, that's when memory slips happen. That's when you're just kind of praying now, of course, you can do this with all of the fingers. So after four, I would go to third finger and I would also do it on all four strings. So this exercise will guarantee a more intentional approach to the instrument and as a result, a higher quality of sound. For exercise number six, we're going to do a two octave scale on one string using two fingers. So if we did a G major, So you notice at the very top there, I'm doing that finger replacement. It's impossible to play the G, F sharp if you don't kind of push one out of the way of the other. Now going on to second and third finger, we're going to play open one, two, three, and then continue with two, three. And you see the way that I'm shifting. I'm not trying to hide the shift. I'm even using kind of this um, extended grace period, let's call it. So I'm stealing time from the old note and using that to make my way down kind of in a very smooth manner. And then we do the same thing for third and fourth finger. So on the E string, let's say, go open one, two, three, four, and then three, four all the way. Um, so you should be doing these with the same bowings we mentioned before. So I'll show you with four note slurs now. Um, So if you notice, my fingers were pretty scrunched up together up here. I'm trying not to let them fly around like this. We don't want that.
again with the finger replacement. Remember, we can do this with vibrato as well. Of course, the vibrato is going to have to be a bit narrower the higher you go, otherwise... This is actually a very good exercise because our vibrato is quite tight up there, uh, if we're not careful. But in the end, we don't want it to be that wide. And... For a deeper dive into two-finger scales, uh, I made an entire video dedicated to that. And it's one of my favorite exercises. There's so many things we can do with that. Exercise seven is going to be a one octave scale using double stops, right, on, on two strings. So we're gonna start with thirds. Roger Ricci once said that the most useful exercise, if he could only pick one, is uh, glissando scales and thirds, and just you playing thirds in general. So this one is really worth its weight in gold. We'll start in C major, so on C and E. <laughs> So right now I'm just playing very slowly, trying to find the best intonation that I can. Um, notice I'm, I'm using every open string that I can to check notes. And I'm releasing the pressure to find the next shape of the arm, shape of the hand for the next double stop. Here I have to replace fingers to get it in tune. Notice where I am in terms of the sounding point. Closer to the bridge. So all the same principles that we've been talking about. The way you shift, double stops, single notes, it doesn't matter. It's kind of this pendulous swinging motion. The thumb goes with the hand and the arm leads. Once you get comfortable with that, we're going to shift over to the next position. So starting in second position on D. Let's say we're gonna do a D major scale, for example. Definitely not easy. Challenge yourself and move on to the subsequent position so you could do uh, E flat major. Now we're gonna do this on all three pairs of strings and using the same bowings as we looked at last time. So two note slurs, four note slurs, separate, and uh, dotted eighth plus sixteenth and sixteenth plus dotted eighth. So that, that one's particularly difficult. Already preparing for the shift down by bringing the elbow under. See, I'm using the guiding note, first finger.
For exercise number eight, we go back to the basics. And what we're going to do is play all of the natural harmonics on the G string in a row up and down. And then back down. And you'll find that there are two different fingerings to try for this. The natural harmonics on the string uh, exist at mathematically determined points uh, along the length of the string. So the octave is our kind of main natural harmonic, and that exists exactly at the midpoint between the bridge and the nut. Now if I take half of that again, I get the octave higher than that, right? And then in between that, I have the fifth, and I have it on the other side as well. So it's all, it's all math, but that's kind of besides the point. What we want to do is feel the position of all of these mathematical points without actually pressing the finger down. So it'll give us a very flexible feeling while at the same time looking for accuracy because we typically associate accuracy with you know this kind of finger coming down motion um, so by practicing with these natural harmonics we can go all the way up and down without pressing so this exercise is all about lightness very very light and very light in the left hand so by being very light and feeling relaxed, yet at the same time going to this scary part of the fingerboard, we're training a sense of ease and mapping that onto the more challenging places that we're going to be playing in. And of course, this can be done on any one of the four strings. For the ninth and final exercise, we're going to be working on double stop trills. I know that sounds scary, but this exercise is not too complicated and it really gives you a chance to work on the dexterity of the fingers. It's one thing to practice uh, trills on, one f uh, on a single note or uh, shradic or some dexterity exercises, but it's another to do double stop trills. Um, and the reason is when you have a finger held down, all of the other fingers are now going to be uh, slightly less mobile, less dexterous than if all the fingers were free. So by holding one double stop down, let's say this third, it's gonna be harder to trill, let's say the second finger, than if I was only holding the first finger down. That's always gonna feel more free, right? So this is going to train our fingers in different situations with different fingers held down. Applebaum lists four variations for this exercise. Uh, so first we're going to do eighth notes, then eighth note triplets, then we're going to do the dotted eighth plus sixteenth that we've done before, and the sixteenth uh, plus dotted eighth going backwards, and then finally playing in sixteenth notes, right? So we're building the speed of that trill. So notice I have decisive motion in the second and fourth fingers, and they're being lifted fairly high, and they're dropping with good energy, but I'm never squeezing them. Yeah? So it's this simultaneous lightness in the fingers, as in never pressing too much, and springiness of the lifting and the dropping. The lifting motion is actually the more important one, so I'm feeling the uh, extensor muscles here pulling the fingers up. It's like there's a string here, 
And every time I pull it, two and four go up, right? Rather than doing something here in the intrinsic area of the hand, I wanna do it from here. That'll give me more height, more articulation, and I won't have to press as hard. So you'll see in the PDF that Applebaum suggests different combinations of thirds. Uh, honestly, you can pick any combination on any two strings. One variation he gives is where you lift the lower fingers as well as the upper fingers. We're always taught to keep the bottom fingers down, but it's actually very good for developing the dexterity of the hand uh, if you lift the bottom. So it's gonna feel more involved to lift one and three as well. But if you find a way to just use that um, external longer muscle uh, from the elbow to pull those fingers up and then dropping them like this and not like this, right? We're not dropping them against the thumb. We're dropping them like this and the fingerboard happens to get in the way and stop the finger. That, that's how you should conceptualize it, right? So that way the fingers function as little mallets, little hammers, right? They would have kept going. So they're not pressing once they arrive. Hit and release. If I think of this, the oppositional force, instinctively I'm gonna to want to press. So that, that's a very important thing to keep in mind. So I wanna prepare those little bursts. Ta -da, ba -bum. I'm kind of imagining in my mind the fingers coming up and down. For a more intense version of this exercise, and again, this is one of my absolute favorites, uh, that is the Vemos Corgive exercise for double stops. I think it's the best approach and a very elegant one to uh, improving the clarity of your fingers in double stops. So that's it, nine exercises to really overhaul your technique and create ease in your playing. Let me know in the comments if you have a favorite one. And if you find some of these very difficult, try to notice when you have kind of aha moments and I'd love to hear about those as well. As always, thanks for joining me and thanks for supporting me on Patreon. Be sure to check out my other masterclass videos and subscribe if you'd like to see more of them. Be well and see you next time.